Ohikurangite maunga wai kutewa ko ngā tikro te iwi, ko mātuku te ruru, ko mātuku te reia ngā pā, ko waite mata te moana ngā tiki ata te wai o hua, te iwi. E mihiana ki te rangi, e mihiana ki te whenua. Ka tūpau ki ngā kāhui maunga ngā wai horapa te mauri tapu o ngā mana whakahaere, ngā iwi taketake o panganui ātā, te ngā kautu. Nā whai anō ka tangi ki ngā mate hukua te wā haere atu rā haere hai. E te tī, e te tā, e te tini ka hui mai, nei whakatau mai, whakatau mai, whakatau mai. I acknowledge the assembled mountains and teeming rivers and seas, the mana of the iwi today, of the past of Panami Atara, as well as those who have passed on in these days, including the many lost in war, suffering and exploitation, those suffering from their conditions and those who have passed due to misfortune. Kamihi, kamihi, kamihi. And yet today, as the winds shift and the clouds turn, and the summer of our discontent draws to a close, an autumn of struggle begins. Here now I focus on the conditions and responses of the Māori people in the recent past and how we shall stand in the near future. There has been much ado about nothing in the halls of power. The past hundred or so days of rampant reputation of repeal after repeal has seen an assault on the rights of all people of the working class. None so much, none so insidiously as that of Pangata Fenwa in Aotearoa New Zealand. Many of these changes provide obvious material advantages to the government or further interests of those they support. Capitalist influence has never been so obvious in the $3 billion in tax cuts that shall line the pockets of land speculators and property investors while the cost of living rises ever higher. Ko ia te kai rawa, ka hao. As the fisherman drags his net of plenty, so does the capitalist acquire his own morsels, such net wealth snatched from the vast sea of toilets. <laughs> In many, other, uh, in many other respects, the Kaumanatanga's agenda is a drift of material concerns, more focused on pushing ideological agendas. <laughs> it is so much clearer when we contrast the last national government with this one. John Key's national coalition was an enemy of the enemy of Māori, or rather they sold themselves as such. The Māori Centre and Māori Conservative power plays uh, budding bourgeoisie following the tikanga of the system, despite being all too aware of National's easy pivot to race baiting with Don Brash's ungentle nothings at Orewa in 2004, saw an opportunity to implement change within the system. Historically, the disadvantage for Māori from the dishonouring of Te Tiriti o Waitangi was that iwi, and Hapu were dispossessed of most of the economic base by the government and its agents in the pursuit of systematic, state-sponsored accumulation, assimilation and annihilation of independent Māori power and resources. The seizure of the entire fortress seabed after proving legal ownership saw a surge of reaction. Disregarding the Court of Appeals judgment that recognised no legislation had been written that seized the Hortra and Seabed prior, Labour went and wrote it themselves. The Labour Party's political calculus saw the creation of an Ope keen to pursue Māori interests for Māori. The Māori Party, as it was called then, emerged, channeling the energy of an activated Māori working class. With the Labour Party eagerly throwing themselves into the race for racist votes with the Fortra and Seabed controversy, by the 2008 election, it was a simple matter for the National Party to move to woo Māori leadership with promises of capitalist development, treaty settlements and a place in government. It is telling that with every election, less and less Māori voted for the Māori Party until their successful bid for the Māori electorates in the 2023 election. Hence the past five decades focus on rights, recovering lost mana by reactivating the Treaty of Waitangi and now a revived legal interest in futility. 
was a first step back to the full participation promised in Article 3. Mana and money sound very alike, as Sir T. Penny O'Regan used to say. Creating a prominent board of Māori business interests saw the Crown rather effectively playing divide and conquer between iwi, papu, Fano and capitalist constructs that are iwi holdings companies. Though it still must be remembered, this is in the context of taking what we can in a capitalist world. Where once tribes presided, a colonial state now casts the long shadow of the lands. It was the magnanimity of Hapu and Fano that granted the settler government access. Now the situation has been reversed. The corporate bodies of such iwi as Ngāti Whātua, Paitahu and Mekato Sainui, among others, settled treaty breaches and chartered co-governance agreements that provided meaningful resources and legal cultural protections. But many working class Māori still suffered and languished under National's anti-worker positions. John Key and his National Party did not need to go on an offensive against the concept of treaty principles in order to affect the needs of the capitalist ruling class. They managed to rule in their interests, trampling the working class and the oppressed in the process. 90-day trials and the attacks against union movements all continued under an official policy of biculturalism. The national government of yesteryears provided for social mobility and positions of wealth and influence for some Māori, while the majority continued to be disproportionately poor, disproportionately incarcerated, and the victim, victims of day-to-day -day racism. Then up there, Romney. Much as Helen Clark's Labour Party was happy to bend the needs of political injustice and popular prejudice, the explicit attacks on official biculturalism isn't simple pragmatism. It is reactionary politics. It represents a change in the spirit of the National Party, influenced, of course, by its coalition partners. It is the desperate guard of the sordid colonial ghost, the rattle of that people of Te Kawana Kray, Governor Gray, the notions of an assimilation of the Māori people into a distinctive New Zealand character. Te Kamaratana, led by National's Christopher Luxon, and with the populist New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters and ACT Party's plutocratic populist David Seymour, sharing the Deputy Prime Minister role, have announced at least a dozen policies, policies that provide for Māori will be repealed or reviewed. Rolling back initiatives designed to improve Māori health outcomes, stopping race-based policies, and minimising Māori language use in the public service. It plans to scrap the Māori Health Authority, the Aka Whaiota, set up to reverse negative Māori health outcomes and repeal legislation designed to prevent the removal of Māori children and their families. Announcing this, Luxon said voters wanted services provided on the basis of need, not race. He was strengthening democracy for all New Zealanders. He told the Post newspaper, there are some things that we just need a bit of rebalancing and a clarity of. This same clarity is providing for the changing of the RNA to enable rezoning of Māori land held in partnership with God to be mined at the Kalanas Legion. In much the same way, the New Zealand Constitution Act of 1852 changed the trajectory of Aotearoa's politics from that of imperial British interests to that of local capitalists, businessmen and land speculators, so does the election of our recent coalition. Clothed in the banner of freedom, equality and security to all good and fair New Zealanders, rights are stripped from the wretched of Papatuan, the toiling masses. First they came for the mongrel mob, and I said nothing, for I was not a dog. <laughs> Next they came to the beneficiaries, and I said nothing, for I wasn't a beneficiary. Soon after they came to the teachers, and I said nothing, for I wasn't a teacher. And after that they came to the activist judges, and I said nothing, for I was neither. Then they finally came for the mob, and you must realise they had come for us a long time ago. <laughs> Franz Bannon's Wretched of the Earth provides a poignant whakatauki. You are making us into monstrosities. Your humanism claims we are at one with the rest of humanity, but your racist methods set us apart. Mm -hmm. So what does the reaction look like? How, you may ask, are Māori responding? 
the domestic call of the kaka and the piercing wail of pukeko is as familiar a sound as the outrage among many in the Maori world. Within the year, there has been dramatic mobilization across the Maori. Julian Wilcox, with passionate, powerful rhetoric, intoned with pepeha and whakatauki from every major iwi group, from the far north to, to Rakiura, from Paranaki to Ukirangi, that every single tribe is united against the governing agenda. And it wasn't just bluster. Being there at Waitangi myself and hearing every cheer as whakapapa was laid out and recognised was as lightning on a lake. The electrified Māori and Tamuvia alike were transfixed as those who recognised the place names saw themselves reflected on the pipe. <clears throat> Running into a group of Ngāti Pro from the coast in their Highway 35 shirts, I had asked if they were Ngātis and if they knew any kōheres. Within a couple of minutes, they were sharing their grievances with another relation so far from home. <laughs> they had simply said, we were here for a scrap. Snippets of conversation across the three days I was there was animated, many coming to Waitangi such as myself for the first time. The Hui Amotsu and the gathering at Ma Rathana, both in the preceding weeks, saw movements often at odds in Kopapa and Tikanga uniting. When the Tumaki to Heitia put out the call for Iwi to attend, again, mountains moved. 10,000 people of all creeds and lines of descent arrived to organise resistance. Pingite and independent tribes alike sent delegations. Ngāpuhi, notoriously maintaining an impassioned independence, sent a delegation of 400. Ngāti Whātua, only the year before, had rebuked the Waikato delegation directly at the Matatini over overlapping claims and settlement disagreements, sent a delegation as well. Mm. 10,000 people rumbled into Ngāwawākia. They came from all tribes from all corners of the country. Kotahitanga. Solidarity is becoming a very real motivator for Māori. Mai ngā tōpito tanga o te motu mai ngā haue pā from every coast and every wind, ngai Māori are rallying. Fano are uniting the unquenchable thirst for a freer world comes. Where nationals form a partnership with Iwi corporate heads provided a means of moderating Māori nationalism with token resources, Christopher Luxon's government now has a deal with the investment. Waikato Tainui as a corporate entity has carefully nursed its investments to nearly $2 billion in total value. They have been happy to use these assets to fund proceeding against the Crown, invoking breach of the Article 2 of the Territorial Waitangi, as the government's reticence against promoting te reo Māori meona tikanga, indeed a reticence to the point of apathy, nay, snide dismissal of the importance of our language and customs. In comparison, Hobson's pledge resources are no longer insurmountable. Our plucky geriatric colonialists had to put up a public appeal to support an embattled real estate agent who refused a mandatory training course on tikanga. As an affront to her fundamental freedoms, they can't pay the fee themselves of $1,200. Personal crusade against Māori tika can no longer be funded off the cuff. A matter of logistics still requires collaboration from such characters as Rain Park, who pumped 70000 to the right-wing coalition during the election, or the right family's funding of the platform as a far-right agitation station. Recently legitimised by the appearance of Christopher Hopkins in an interview with the indefatigably venomous Sean Plunkett. And yet even still, with some you we certainly more well off than others, what does this bring to the fight? What is this showing us today? This, I feel, is the most important point. Though this government intends to drag the hands of time back to the 70s, the fact of the matter is that Māori survived the 70s while well in a fugue state. Broken people with little land, wealth, or deal managed to snatch life from the hungry jaws of empire. Where only 5% of the population could speak te reo Māori, the numbers have jumped up to 30% with a confident understanding and simple ability to converse. 8% on top of that speaking it very well. Just as Joe Williams and his court at Te Rito Rito in 
2017, recounted his travels through the west coast across Taranaki into Ngāti Papa and Ngāti Raukawa, where he would see Māori Kaina and even Marae reduced the food halls, Whareinui and Urupā. He says quite actively, and yet that Marae still lives. The, vill- the village gone, land gone, what level of resilience does that tell you that would have you painting that whare, holding your tangi there and holding all your main events there still after your people have left? And informed him of the simple fact that Māori values and principles have survived the rigorous works of stamping them out. Despite the alienation from land, language, tikanga and each other, Māori collectivism and the spirit of kotahitanga remains. The key principle of whanaungatanga is something that can and should inform the character of class solidarity and should inform the actions of my Māori going forward. There is, of course, much work to be done. Our tamariki may yet be stolen as Goronga tamariki's obligations to utility may be removed. Their parents potentially incarcerated as much as five times the rates of Pākei committing the same crime due to institutional racism that can only be strengthened by this coalition's policies. The median income is lower and our lifespans shorter, but we will survive. We live in a time where technology has the capacity to weave communities across the globe. Collective self-determination is now at hand. The idea of a Māori consciousness is increased with every challenge, common interests and policies are organised and the struggle for political power continues. The Māori struggle is that of contradicting political forces, a microcosm of class relations and a macrocosm of the class struggles. It must be recognised as at once an independent but utterly connected struggle. I thus lay out the wheels, the ISO. Te tamatū, te tamaura, te tamanoho, te tamamate. Those that take action live. Those that are idle are left in the dust. Though there is still much to hear and so know, from knowledge comes understanding, from understanding comes wisdom, and from wisdom must come action. Tēnā anō e te tī e te tā, nā whai anō, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tātana koutou.